the former presidential candidate Ahmed Buhari. Ahmed, you are welcome to Nebo TV. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much, Nebo TV. It's a pleasure. So we are here today to discuss about uh, Nigerian youth and leadership. As a presidential candidate yourself, former presidential candidate, what advice do you have for Nigerian youth? What advice can I have for Nigerian youth? I think I think um, the most important thing is uh, education is still key. Many people have to stay in school. Um, we need to we need to understand that um, if you do not have that education, you can't have that balance in your thought process. And that is what I think is affecting many Nigerians. The other thing that I want us to also understand is in this educational space that we have, we must start revisiting the curriculum and start weeding out courses that will not be profitable to our young generation or our future generations. Because most of those courses mm. do not really have any relevance in today's economic standing. Again, I want us to also, as young people, understand what fights to pick, when to pick those fights, and how to eventually fight the fight. Now, these are three things in one that I just mentioned. Mm -hmm. what fight to pick, how to pick the fight, and how to go about fighting that fight when you do pick that fight. It is very important because many young people do not understand these things. And you see people on the streets protesting and fighting over a cause that will never be materialized. And I'm saying, if we have identified that some of the biggest problems in Nigeria are things like ethnicity, religion, social status, mm -hmm. political party, ideological affiliations, gender parity, and all of those other things. Why don't we start fighting the fight from that angle and pick a thing like state of origin, for example, and say, for us to have a country that is balanced, can we scrap out state of origin? I can assure you, that if we go out there as young people collected together, regardless of where we are from and our faith base, mm -hmm. and say, we are here on the streets, to ask for one thing, that the National Assembly should remove state of origin in all the forms that we feel, so that every Nigerian will be seen as equal, and the opportunities that are before us will not be given to us based on where we're from. If that is done, you now have a level playing field. When you look at what the government is trying to do, you will realize that part of the reasons why they are failing is because they have been unable to convince the people that this and, and tell the people that this is where we are going to. So that idea of having a direction and clearly define the direction to the people and the people agreeing to go with you is the first step towards success. But unfortunately, we are not able to find the right message to present to the people, especially the people in government, to present to the people that this is where we are going so that the people can take a break, take a deep breath, believe in you, support you towards that promised land. These are the things that I want our young people to start focusing on right now if we want to succeed. But going on the street to say, I'm an activist, I'm an looter guy, it doesn't make any sense. Last year, we had an election that had about 80 presidential candidates. The whole place was, the whole place was messed up. That was so hilarious. <laughs> it was hilarious. It was indeed. But you see, what even make what even made it more hilarious was the fact that if you remove Buhari, uh, remove Atiku, all the other candidates together <laughs> could not raise two hundred thousand votes. So that's what motivated you to uh, the camp to APC. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. But if you look at a political space, if you look at the politics of Nigeria or anywhere in the world, the first thing a politician must learn is to be realistic. If you cannot see, then there's no point for you to think of leading. We could see very clearly that, yes, I am at Buhari. Yes, I'm here. I am saying it to the world. I'm the first young person in this country, in Nigeria, to ever come out to contest for the office of the president. At a time where everybody was scared, everybody thought it was going to be a, a, a disaster. They're going to kill you. 
You were the I was first. The I was the first person. Every other person came after me. And if you want me to mention names, I will tell you some people like Showore that I had met in Sahara Reporters to tell him that I'm mm -hmm. going to be contesting for the office of the president and mm -hmm. came out a few a few months later to say he's also going to be contesting. I met people like Feladuru Koye and said we would like your support. Feladuru Koye came out to say he was, he was going to be contesting. And mm -hmm. many other people that we met. The truth of the matter is people like um, OBS the Questlay, for example, um, she was even the umpire when we were having the packed meeting, packed presidential aspirants coming together. And Obiye Zekwesele was there to be the umpire to see a process that was going to deliver us mm -hmm. somebody that we were all going to support. Mm -hmm. Somebody emerged a few months, a few, a few days or a few weeks later, Obiye Zekwesele came out to say she was also contesting. These are the things that made that campaign almost worthless. And so for many young people, who would have been thinking, oh, I kind of like this guy. Let me support him. Now there are so many other people. Fire. Fire. Are you there? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, can you. Now, this is what I want us to understand. At the time we supported, or the, at the time we decided to support a candidate before the elections, it was based on the fact that we could clearly see that we could not possibly win the election. And in my opinion, it didn't make any sense to say, oh, I'm not going to win the election, but what the heck, I'm going to get to the end. And then what happens? Politics is not played like that. In politics, the things that you want is your ability to see what lies ahead, your ability to predict correctly, and the alliances you form along the way. Those alliances you form along the way is what keeps you in political relevance. It is what you can latch on and climb the ladder towards your destination but if you say you're going to say oh i'm going to, because after the election came out the result was announced mm. the winner was announced nearly three months later somebody came out and said revolution now we are going to burn down this country we are going to remove the dss the afcc doesn't matter the judicial system is corrupt dude you took part in an election and the people did not vote for you what is it again? What we expect from you at this point in time is to, is to go back and build your base that will support you for the next election. It's a democracy. If we're saying that it's a democracy that we are going to run, then why destabilize the democratic process? No. Why, why destabilize the democratic system? Yeah, no, for in Nigeria, I would say there is no such thing as free and fair election. Many youths believe that the election was rigged. Some of them were trying to agitate against you know, the you know, Nekwe, I, 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 yeah. you, you, you are in the United, you, you are in Canada, right? Yeah. I've heard this from a lot of people in the diaspora. Mm -hmm. I, Ahmad Buhari, I was on ground. I was in this country during the elections. Mm -hmm. I could tell very clearly that the election was between two candidates. As at, the, as at November 2018, mm -hmm. I was certain that there were two candidates. And I remember in 2018, November, I decided that since we're not going to win this election, let us do what we have to do so that we can remain relevant after the elections. And I met, I called someone like um, uh, Dr. Kingsley Mogalu, and I said, Mogalu, let's have a sit down. Mogalu obliged. I went to Mogalu's office. I said, Mogalu, we're not going to win this election. This is what I want us to do. I want us to team up. I want us to work together. If not for anything, just to show the Nigerian people that we have the ability to come together for mm -hmm. a purpose. For a purpose, yeah. Mogalu told me that he was going to be sworn in May 29, 2019. And that if I want to join his campaign team, he has an office for me in the campaign team. <laughs> oh my God! <laughs> but you see, but you see. I, 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 I'm, I've been keeping all these stories and these events of people that we met. I know I met people like, I called Fela. I said, Fela, let us meet up. It was in Lagos. Fela said, I'm in Lagos. I said, okay, fine. I'm going to meet you in Lagos. Where do we meet? He said, a co-hotel. I went to a co-hotel. I waited for Fela one hour, two hours, three hours, four hours. Eventually, Fela said he couldn't make it. We said, okay, fine. Since you're going to be in Abuja in two weeks, let's meet in Abuja. When Fela was in Abuja, I saw Fela face to face. I said, let's see later in the day. Fela agreed. Called Fela at the time we were supposed to meet. Phone was switched off. 
Show sure worry. Apart from the fact that I had met him in his office when, when I was invited by Sahara reporters for an interview when I had declared to run for the office of the president. We had this interview. So like um, Showere came out. I said, Showere, we're going to be contesting for this presidency. Egbo, we need all the support we can get. Uh, no problem. I, I, I'm with you anytime. No problem. It's okay. <laughs> Showere came out to say I was going to contest. Now, this was, it, this was still okay for me. We still reached out to Showere and said, Showere, I think somebody broke out that meeting. Her name is Adesua Okosu. Mm. For, uh, legendary musician late legendary musician from your state sonny okosu mm. his daughter this she said you know what I, I i want you to meet with show worry i would like us to have a sit down and see what we can properly do to synergize mm. and so i picked a place in ikeja a hotel in ikeja uh i can't remember the name right now but there's a hotel in ikeja and then we said we were going to meet at the hotel in, in ikeja and we were in that hotel one hour, two hours, three hours. And show where he said, look, I'm at the airport. I'm trying to get my things. I can't get my things. Just wait for me a little bit. And I realized that from 2 p.m. that we were supposed to have that meeting, we were there up to 7 p.m. Eventually, he called to say, we cannot have that meeting today. Okay, no problem. I promise I'll make it up to you. Show where he never called. You know, everything you just explained right now shows that the youth are not ready. When exactly. I still think that for us to have a successful government, mm. a successful administration in Nigeria, mm. it must be led by the youth and really? the old. It must be led by the youth and the uh, old. old. Okay. I have okay. also come to the realization that mm. age... It's not a function of good leadership. Because you are old doesn't mean that you have good leadership to give. Because you are young doesn't necessarily mean you have good leadership to give. So that means we must find a way to have everybody taking a role in this game, including women. Women must be given a huge chunk of the responsibility, so also youth and the older people. It must be a collective. If we cannot come like that, it will not work. But for us to sit down and say, we know that the young, young people are the ones that will rescue the country, I will not be a party to that. For us to sit down and say, um, um, old people are the people that have all the solutions, I am telling you that it is not true. However, what can actually help the combination of all of these people coming together for the success of our governance structure, for the success of our democracy, is transparency, accountability and good that will lead us to good governance now this transparency accountability that will give us good governance will never be achieved if the country does not put in place proper data management systems those proper data management systems are the things that would expose corruption are the things that would give us a true reflection of our elections are the things that would help us know exactly how many people are in Nigeria and what resources do we truly have? And that the resources we have, will it really be able to go around the people that we have in this country? If it's not going to be able to, how much do we really sincerely need to borrow that can cushion the effects? What areas of the economy do we need to visit that can start generating revenue? These are the things that we need to start focusing on. So is the government even planning to um, uh, upgrade the country or this computer system like the one we, are, we have in the West? Is the government working towards achieving this goal? Yes. Yes. The government have gotten some, they have some institutions in place mm. that are responsible for data collection, data collation, data mining. But in my opinion, how we're going about it is not giving us the rapid results that we need. Already, there are some institutions that government has put in place that will collect data from, uh, from different people. From the banking sector, you are supposed to give your BVN for you to be able to operate an account. From the, from the, from the communications, telecommunications sector, mm -hmm. if you do not give your details, if you do not give your data, you cannot even be allowed to use your phone line. 
if you go down to, I can't remember the name of the commission, but there is a commission that is responsible for data collection. collection. If you go to the people that travel abroad with international passports, they all have data, thumbprints, mm -hmm. I, whatever that we that the government has collected. Mm -hmm. What is expected to be done? We even have um, um, we even have this exercise where people go give their uh, I, I can't remember national national um, uh, commission something for something to put together our data. Now my point is, all of this data that you have collected and from different organizations and institutions, it is time that you put it together and call Ahmed Buhari and say, your number is ready. Go to social social office and collect it. And when I go there and I see my number, Ahmed Buhari, my number is 6122591. I know that this is my number. Anywhere I want to go to, if I don't have this number, I cannot access that place. It is, not a question, it is not a question of carrying one card. I just need to be asked. If the police stops me and say, who are you? I say 6611925. They put it into their system. It comes up with something. They know that you're a bona fide Nigerian. Mm -hmm. This will help us curb corrupt, corruption. This will help, help us curb uh, um, terrorism. This will help us Isn't manage the crimes. company. It will also help them to tackle crimes. People exactly. who are carrying uh, criminal records in the country. All the terrorism and everything. I mean, you, you see somebody, you look suspicious, and you stop him, and he tells you, oh, I'm from Jigawa. Meanwhile, he's not even a Nigerian. We yeah. cannot identify, we cannot differentiate the people that are coming from those borderlines because they kind of look like us. Exactly. We are the same people. Exactly. Then when you, go, when you go down to Lagos, mm. people that are coming in from Benin Republic every day, mm. you cannot differentiate them. They even speak Yoruba. Uh. Don't forget one thing, yeah? Mm. Nigeria actually signed a treaty for the free West African uh, trade uh, about 12 years ago during um, Umaru Musa Yaradua's uh, tenure mm. before he passed away. And that, that treaty is supposed to allow the free movement of people across the West African region for the purpose mm. of trade. Mm. So that sort of gives those people the leverage to come into your space. Mm. But because Nigeria is one of the greenest places across the globe across the West African space, mm. most of them want to come to Nigeria to see if they could get greener pastures. Now, I don't have a problem with that still. What I have a problem with is these individuals are not documented. As it, for a real country, when you're coming into the borders of the country, you're supposed to give your data. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to know where you're going to be staying, exactly. how, long, how long you intend to stay there. When you're going to be leaving, while you are there, what are you going to be doing? Do you even have a work permit mm. to earn money while you are in this country? Yes. Those are the things that we have to put in place. Because it, by all means, this, uh, this is the bad side of the discussion. The good side of the discussion is there are lots of Nigerians who produce things and export to other West African countries. And it's helping grow economy. It is also important for us to recognize the fact that some of these people who come into this country come in genuinely to find a living. And they are taking up on some jobs that we cannot find Nigerians that are willing to do those jobs. If that is the case, all we need from them is proper documentation that has to be done by the Nigeria Immigration Service. And this data must be properly prepared in such a way that we are able to communicate effectively to the Nigerian let it be that at every three months, we can, the, the Nigerian system can comfortably say, we have this number of people within our country. We have this number of people that have traveled out of the country. Let us have a system that we can use to work to successfully get things happening. Okay. Do you mean that uh, having this computer system in Nigeria, we have to reduce uh, uh, fraud, election fraud in Nigeria? Of course, of course. I will give you an example. You have to commend the Buhari administration when it comes to its uh, implementation of um, the BVN and the um, TSA, Treasury Single Account System. To be honest with you, Nekme, a lot of people, even if they are still stealing, they are stealing with so much caution. Mm. There's so much fear because they know that the moment you try to trace money moving from account, one account to the other account, you can easily find out the source, you can even easily find out the beneficiary, and it's easy to capture people. That is why 
if you look at EFCC these days, they're having a field day because all they need to do is request for your bank statement. They trace all the funds from, to, from every COBO that comes to your account. Mm. They can trace where it's coming from. Yeah. If you also look at the, the boys doing Yahoo Yahoo, mm. they've actually soft pedaled because there's a high, uh, a high monitoring uh, mechanism that is ensuring that we try to curb that irregularity, especially from some young, desperate Nigerians who, in sincerity, are totally lost as to what they can possibly do to earn a good living. That is why from the beginning of our discussion, I told you that education is so important. It is that thing that you need that can give you that total foundation for the, tr for the, tr for the true struggle that you have to do in Nigeria and the world. Sure. But then, politically, we must understand how to pick our fights at youth. Fights yeah. that we can win. Okay. With what we experienced in this past election with the youth, do you think there's a hope that the youth will one day take over Nigeria from the so-called Kabas? Let me give you a quick story, Nekbe, please. When we were in um, university, there was a friend of mine that was actively involved in politics. So anytime there was a political discourse or anything that had to do with departmental elections, school politics, we always invite him to negotiate. So when we were in 100 level, mm. first year in university, they called him and said they wanted to contest in departmental politics. Mm. But the constitution of that department read that if you are in 100 level, you cannot contest for an elected office. However, you can vote. Mm. So those who were interested in contesting for elected office in mm. 100 level started having a problem with the ex schools because the ex schools were insisting that they will not be allowed to contest. Yes, yeah. So when they called with my friend, he now looked at the situation and now said, okay, you know what? Why don't we agree that we can contest for this office, this office, that office, and then we leave you with office of the president of the department, vice president, treasurer, and so, 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 so. But we let us contest for this ones. Mm -hmm. And there, there was an agreement. Now, the agreement came out and these people contested and they won election. Oh. By the time by the time they now became seniors, they now contested for those higher offices yeah. and they won. When they now won, a new 100 level set came. And when this new 100 level set came, they said, how can we not contest? If we can vote, we must contest. So, <laughs> so they now said, how can we not contest? They now said, you cannot contest. Somebody now advised them that there's one guy that helped negotiate some years ago. Go yeah. and look for him in 300 level now. They now went to meet this, my friend. He now said, what? You mean 100 level cannot contest? But we agree that if my if my people get in there, they're going to amend the constitution so that 100 level can contest. They said, no, they can't contest. So he now went for the next meeting. I now called his friends. I said, ah, why don't you guys amend this in the constitution? They said, ah, don't you know that if we amend this in the constitution, these boys can win us in an election because you know there are more. 100 level are plenty. You see? You see? So. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said earlier that. We uh, must be honest. I'm sure we must be... from home, from the family, then to the school system. That's what I said. You see? So you can see uh, that in this game of politics, it has a lot to do with your ability to see what lies ahead. It has a lot to do with your ability to negotiate. It has a lot to do with ability to form alliances because it is a game of negotiation. You cannot win all. You can win some. And God help you. When you win, you still remain a good person. You can now implement all of those things that you want to do. Ooh. Not forgetting that the bad boys will still be there. And the best you can do with them is to say, if you were collecting 100 million per day before, I am sorry now, we cannot happen, but we will leave you with 5 million. And then you start inching in. But you cannot have that negotiation if you do not have power. Mm. You can't. So all this talk of um, a, it must happen now, now, it will not. All these people that, all this, okay, let me give you an example. Mm. In the last election, among all the younger people that contested, 
I would like to rank our popularity as Showere, Mogalu, Fela, Ahmed Buhari, and so on. But do you know that someone like Showere, who is highly respected as a youth activist, mm. could not even get an endorsement from the Nigeria Association, National Association of Nigerian Students, NANS? Even NANS did not endorse him. Why? Because NANS would rather endorse an older candidate. Because they want something. They want something. You don't want to endorse a, a political party that will not win the election. That is the thing. That is the but thing. You know, but you know one funny thing, and it's important that we note this. In the 2019 election, hmm. NANS, National Association of Nigerian Students, ended up endorsing nobody. Really? Yes. You know why? Why? Because the Buhari administration mm. refused, refused, very mm. carefully listen to this, refused to give any group or groups of persons uh. any sort of monetary support for an endorsement. For endorsement, okay. So, NAS just stood alone and watched. But before now, what they normally would do is to go there, they get some money, and they make an endorsement and mobilize their people to support you. It didn't happen this time around, which is why I want to, to always remind people that the Buhari, I, the Buhari administration, the Buhari administration did not use money to influence people. And that is why you find a lot of people today feeling very angry that they endorsed Buhari, they did not get money, they did not get anything. Because that is the truth. Because the Buhari government didn't offer money to any group to endorse the political party. But what happened with Heineck? Do they pay Heineck? I want you to also understand one thing. Now that you've brought up the discussion of Heineck, mm -hmm. I want you to understand how Heineck is constituted. You see, Heineck has got different levels of operation. On Heineck, you have people like electoral officers. In fact, you have polling unit officers. You have electoral officers. Then you have returning officers. Then you have uh, uh, rush, uh, uh, rectors, national uh, the, the, the ones that oversee the states, and then you have the ones that oversee the regions, and then you have the ones that now submit the results to the INEC chairman. So I want you to understand that the levels of operation on INEC, mm. very few people are the INEC staff. The rest of the people are ad hoc staff. What are ad hoc staff? Mm -hmm. Ad hoc staff are those staff that you employ or recruit a few weeks to the election so that they can support your camp, your, your process. NYC mm -hmm. students, NYC coppers are the ones you use. Mm -hmm. You also use people like university lecturers, university professors. These are the people that collate all of the results at the polling units and now take everything to INEC office in Abuja. If you notice, the people that go to INEC office in Abuja to present the results are always university professors. Do you know that? Okay, but me, I will I, 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 no, I, I have to finish. I, I have to, if you will I, let me finish, I will appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Now, all of these people take these results mm -hmm. to INEC office, and INEC will sit down and say, announce your results. And this, this INEC and this INEC uh, uh, rep from a university professor will now open his book and they will, um, they will make him say it out. We have seen a professor who said he could not see very well. They brought light for him. He said his people could not see very well. He refused to say what he had written because it has been compromised. By who? By probably the people in the state that he was functioning. Now, don't get it wrong. These people that we just mentioned, from the security personnel to the... NYC members, to the university lecturers, university professors, who conduct these elections locally before they take it to Abuja for announcement. Who are they? Are they not Nigerians? They are Nigerians like you and me. Can they not say we're not going to collect money? Why would they say they're not going to collect money? Can they just say, no, I intend to be honest. If I die, let it be that I die speaking the truth. Uh, we don't have that. We don't have so that. Is, that is what I want us to understand. 
that I was on ground. I saw the Buhari election, Buhari Atiku, and the rest of us election. And to be honest with you, Nekpe, I did not see how INEC collected money from anybody. If you have any evidence, I would like you to present the evidence so that we can hold those people who must be guilty accountable. But if we don't have those evidences, then we should rather just keep quiet. Don't do not forget this matter still went to the judiciary. Are we now saying judiciary is bad? The university professors are bad. Even the small young um, coppers are bad. Everybody is bad. Police is bad. Nothing. Everything is not working. What? What? Are we serious? Yes. That, <laughs> that is the definition of Nigeria. Nothing is working in the country. That is just the thing. So, for those who are asking questions, um, I think the topic is written on the screen. We are discussing about Nigerian youth and leadership. Okay, reflecting on the the past election, the past uh, general election, the youth candidates, how they participated in the election, how we can move forward, how the youth can engage in politics in Nigeria, right? There are some right. questions coming here. I know that they're gonna flop this place with questions today. <laughs> I trust my people. <laughs> what is the topic? Okay, uh, what does Mr. Mr. Ahmed Buari thinks about the okay. Let me pull this question here. Okay, Ahmed, you can see. Can you see? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I, I've been, I saw the question already. What do I think about the new chief of staff? Well, um, the only thing I know about the new chief of staff is that he's got an impressive record. Um, I remember, I think when I read his profile, he's been a lawyer in um, university, he has served under the United Nations. Um, he also served in government at different capacities at different times. He is 75 years old, and uh, that is the person that President Buhari has decided to work with as his chief of staff. What I would like to uh, say is I wish, I wish the man all the best. I pray God helps him, direct him to be able to manage the affairs of that office in a way that he will be able to deliver good democracy to Nigerians and help his, his, superior, his boss talking about President Buhari in a way that he will become a better president and better at delivering his responsibilities as the president of the country. If anybody has got anything negative to say about the guy, I will be surprised because we cannot find anything that he has done that's bad. And again, the only thing that I would have held and said, well, I, I probably would want something different is, I probably would have wanted a younger person. I probably would have wanted a 50 year old guy so that he can complement the president with some energy. The, en the president is going to be, the president is 77 years old now. Yeah. You know, if, we, if the president was able to get somebody in his 50s, you know, vibrant, mm -hmm. active, highly, high, highly decentralized, de de mm -hmm. you know, somebody that has got friends from the South, the East, the West, the North, you see him as a fly guy, everybody likes him, you yes. know, he knows, he knows, he knows how to manage people, he knows how to, you know, see beyond what the now and say, okay, fine, we could try this, Mr. President. I believe it's going to give us positivity in future. Exactly. I, I would have been really excited. Exactly. However, however, I'm not President Buhari. Mm -hmm. He probably will be, he probably is able to work with somebody of that age easier than someone younger. So by all means, what I think we can do right now is to support him towards the uh, successful, um, uh, remaining days of his administration, which is where I think that um, our thought process should be. It's important also that for us living in, the, most of us living in diaspora, we must see positivity. We must try to see positivity. The moment you see negativity, it does not just affect your country's ability to prosper, it also affects how people in that diaspora see you. So if you go to Canada, for example, and you say, oh, this is how is Nigeria? Oh! Nigeria is bad. Nigeria, ah. Meanwhile, you were already introduced to them as the queen of the Edo kingdom, for example. <laughs> ah, meet Nepe, meet Nepe, the queen of the Edo kingdom. And then Nepe comes in. Thank you very much. So Nepe, tell us about Nigeria. Ah, Nigeria is bad. That is why I came to Canada. If they were, if they were respecting you before, they would just stop respecting you immediately. Yes, it's true. Yes. So we must sell ourselves right. Mm -hmm. We yeah. must believe that we can succeed. We must pick up our success stories and put them in front. 
Exactly. And when we our bad stories, we tell them that it's not just peculiar to Nigeria. There are bad people all over the world. This is how I want us to be looking at these things. You know, so that, that, that's my position really on that. That is why in the West, uh, they, when, when you say you are from Africa, they just the first thing that comes to mind is the negativity in Africa. You understand? Because we, we are the ones that sell that negativity more than anyone else. Yes. We must stop it. We must stop it. We must we stop must. it. We must stop it. That is true. That is what I've been doing. Uh, you can, there's a comment here from your friend, Roland. Why is everything in Nigeria working upside down? How does this look at where I'm living? I'm not, am I upside down? <laughs> I'm in Nigeria, I'm in Abuja. I'm not living upside down. You I go to work every morning, I work my ass out to get myself bread on the table. But I made it uh, honestly. To be honest, the country is not functioning properly. It's not functioning. You, you are a privileged, you are very privileged in Nigeria. Please, you then choose choose your viewpoint very carefully. I am a Buhari. I lost my father when I was just 13 years old. My mom was not fully educated, so we could she, she couldn't even get a job. Oh. Yes, I was not living in any city, I was living in a small town called Pontagora in Niger State. It was like a village about 40 years ago. Wow. That was where I was born. That was where I grew up. My dad died in a road accident. And then we were left like that. But we, we, one thing that I did not refuse, I refused to let go, was mm. the fact that I was going to be successful. I was going to make it. Nothing was going to stop me. Mm. I did not see people's children who were living large as a reason for me to feel bad. No. I saw them, I congratulated them, and I tried to learn from whatever it was they were doing. Do you think that if I was, do you think that if I was, really, if you think if I was really a privileged kid, Mm. That when I came out to contest, you wouldn't have seen big men supporting my campaign because I'm one of their sons. Yeah. They would have. They would have pushed me forward. But mm. the truth of the matter is, a lot of them kept saying, who is his father? Yeah. Where is he from? Who is he? Hello. I want us to understand something. No, no. I, I want us to understand something. Hold on. Hold on. I want us to understand Yes. Hold on, Amen. I'm very inspired with your story. Can you elaborate on how you succeeded? You know, you lost your dad when you were only 13 years old, your mom and every tell us how you succeeded. It's very inspiring. I'm so inspired right now. Can you tell in all, in all, in all honesty, in all honesty, my dad, mm -hmm. my dad, um, from his story, yeah. my dad started his career as a business administration student, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So according to him, when he went to grade level two or so, because he didn't go to a university when he went to grade level when he finished his grade level two he got some sort of qualification that said he had studied as a business administrator and he was looking to work in an office as a receptionist or a you know anything that was going to keep his office work going but he couldn't get it he couldn't get a job because then all you needed in nigeria was somebody who was already working in an office that would sign your reference form and say i know him he can be trusted. Mm. So my dad said he the only person in their family that had that was working in in an office in a government office was one of his uncles that was living in Lagos. Mm. So he traveled all the way to Lagos to meet this uncle. And when he met this uncle, he said, "Uncle, I finished my grade level two. I would really appreciate if you could sign this form for me as a referee so that I can get a job." He said where he dropped that paper for his uncle, where his uncle dropped that paper, that was where the paper was for one year, four months, until he decided to leave his uncle. Mm -hmm. Now, every day as he cleaned the house, because he now he became a houseboy, mm -hmm. pending when he was going to get that form signed, every day as he cleaned the house, he would make sure that he positioned that paper back to that place so that the next person that comes in so that the next time the uncle comes in, he will see the paper. But he didn't sign it. And the wife started using him as a boy boy, house boy. He said the, the worst experience he had in that family, in that house, was when kerosene in the store where the food were kept mm -hmm. spilled into the yam flour, mm -hmm. olubo abi, is that what you call olubo? Amala. Amala. Yeah. The flour of Amala. Mm -hmm. 
He said kerosene spilled into it, and the woman was so upset, and she said he was going to eat all of it. Guess what? He said it was a whole bag of, of olivo. Mm. And he was made to eat that thing through the year he spent in that house waiting to get that paper signed. That's when toxic. that paper, That's toxic. Of course. It was his choice. Either you eat or you go hungry. He didn't have any money. After waiting that long, about 18 months, he decided to leave that his uncle's house and decided to enroll in the Nigerian army mm. as a recruit. So he started his, his, his career in the Nigerian army as a recruit. He was there as a recruit and he started, you know, he grew up up to the rank of a second lieutenant, you mm. know, just Wahala kind of <laughs> life, basically. And that was where he saw my mom in Kano. Mm. And my mom was in form four or so. She was about going to her final year. But her parents were so excited that somebody had come that wanted to marry her. Mm. And, and they said to him, do you agree that you will marry this woman and let her go to school? Oh, yes, 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 yes. But when they got married, they moved to Quantagora. Boom, baby one. Boom, baby two, baby three, baby four, baby five. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in reality, my mom got married at the age of 17. She was 17. Mm. She was 16, sorry. And then she had me when she was 17. So when you see my mom and myself, we're like brother and sister. Oh. Before she was 32, she had six children. So the discussion of school was <laughs> something that we were just hearing in the background. Yes. It was audio, audio, audio school. Yeah. <laughs> and at that time, female education was not very popular. It wasn't a priority. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't a priority, and because life was a bit easier, most of the men could make ends meet without necessarily getting support from their wives. Yes. So yeah. my, my mom my mom was raising the children. She was raising us good. And, you know, we were six of us then, and she was just 32. And that was when my dad had an accident and, and died. Oh. Six children, and low for your mom. Oh, my and, God. And I, I, I was the first. I was just in... The SS1. I was my first year in secondary school. Now, I want you to begin to imagine how she must have managed to raise mm. all six of us. Yeah. Don't forget, we had to go to school. We had to eat food. We had to have clothing. The house we were staying was a rented apartment. So when you see people, do not be so quick to say privileged young kid or privileged northern nigerian kid it is not the issue every single person has a responsibility to believe in themselves and build themselves that is the problem that is why some of us will sit down and make comparison with other people like don't go test children and expect ourselves to be those children everybody's hustle is different you just need to put your act together that is the truth you know how i how, how we manage to go through school mm. wake up every day eat food I can't even remember. Oh my God. It was so much pain that you are praying to forget. It was so much pain that you would see your mom hungry and pretending that she's full just because she wanted to eat what she had provided. I remember a year, a very, very ugly year that throughout that year, I think somebody donated to our family a bag of rice. And that was how we managed that bag of rice and ate it every day throughout the year. And the only thing that we could complement the rice with was onions, dry pepper, and granite oil. Mm. We would fry it so that it would become the sauce. And everybody had to, you know, accept that it was, it, was, it was delicious because that was the only way you could have your sanity. This is how we pulled through. Today, she is a proud mother of six graduates. Some of us really? have got our master's degrees. Some of them are. Some of us are chasing our doctorate degrees. Some of us are working with some international com international organizations. Some of us, like me here, I'm doing what I'm doing in my in my only two years advocacy. Mm. I've got a sister that is a lecturer. I've got another sister that works with the government. I've got a brother that's a businessman. This is exactly what you must believe. You must succeed. And 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 to even top up all of this, she has six children. She has about seventeen grandchildren, and 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 she's a, she's a happy woman today. If these are the things that make her happy, I think God has been kind to her to make her see these things happen. Exactly. But I didn't, 
But at no point did we relax and say, because our father has died, because all the odds are against us, we are not going to, you know, stick our head up and ensure that we succeed in life. Look, Ahmed, Ahmed Buhari, I don't want to interrupt you. To be honest, only few families, few families will succeed in this type of situation that you just depicted. Few families, because in most cases, children from such family will end up in the streets, would end up with deviant behavior in the society. You guys should just consider yourselves as the lucky ones the lo extremely lucky ones. I know that it was also a kind of a determination for you to get education, you and your siblings, but I will guarantee you that few families will succeed in this type of situation in Nigeria. So go ahead, tell us more. It's very interesting and inspiring. Your should I tell you my, 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 should I tell you my definition of success? Okay, go ahead. It's your state of mind. Oh, okay. Your state of mind is your success. If you want to look at things that are out of your reach and you are insisting that you would have to get them, even though you know you do not have any means to get them, mm. you will never feel successful. You will never be happy. You will always be depressed. Yeah, you won't be fulfilled. You won't be fulfilled. Yeah. That ability to give yourself self-fulfillment, in my opinion, is what success truly is. And that is what is lacking in the mindset of a lot of people that live in this country. When you go to other countries, I've, I've been privileged to live in some other countries. When you go to some other countries, you will see some people who, in all honesty, they wake up every day and go to the subway just to play a guitar, pick whatever they can pick, and go home. And they are happy. Here, what you see is everybody wants to have 10 SUVs, one red, one blue, one green, one yellow wants to have different girlfriends. In fact, most of the Nigerian men that are here complaining about the country, give them an opportunity. They will start thinking of where to buy a house for their new girlfriends. I must commend your mom from the story you just told us. I must really commend your mom for raising you guys like this. I know only you, I don't know your siblings, but from what I've observed from you over these years, I think you are a wonderful uh, person. And uh, I will give the credit to your mom for raising you to be a great citizen of Nigeria. So where is your mom now? My mom? Yeah. My mom is um, having a field day. She's traveling from yeah. one son's house to one daughter's house oh. all through the year. <laughs> she was with me from yeah. August to November. Then my younger brother stole her. So she went to stay with him in Kanu for for about a month. Then another brother stole her in Kaduna. Yeah, <laughs> so she keeps moving around, uh, but um, she's still based in Pontagora. She, no. likes the house in, she likes the house in Pontagora in Niger State. Mm -hmm. So when she finishes uh, visiting everybody, she goes back there. She says, um, mm -hmm. I want to go and see my old friends. And then she goes there. Mm -hmm. And funny enough, my mom is still, she's still young. She's still 57 years old. Yeah. So um, so she's, um, she's, my, she's my homie. She's my buddy. We, we still get along, we still talk well, and when she comes mm -hmm. around, she, she plays with our wives, like they're her sisters. Mm -hmm. So yes, um, she's our rock, she's, um, she's the brain behind how we've um, actually turned out. Yeah. Um, I, I think uh, she wasn't a strict mother, but she had a way of presenting her case to you that would make, make you feel guilty if you were doing something bad. And she tells you, why are you doing this to me? Mm -hmm. Can't you see my situation? And then you will feel guilty for the rest of the year. And so for the rest of the year, you'll be a good boy. And then she next year, she'll look for another line to give you and keep you in that state of uh, positivity. So, um, yes, she's I agree. She's she's wrong. a great mom. God bless her for raising you guys to become a great citizens of Nigeria. Yeah. God bless her for that. We would like to see how some of this this. Just to say, share out, mom, for any great kids. <laughs> okay, sure. let's move forward about him. Um, I think some people have some questions here. He said, it is good to be hardworking and self-determined, but without the basic necessity from the government, uh, it will be difficult. Yes, I think, yeah, what do you think about that? Well, it's true. Mm. It's true. And the basic necessity for, from government mm. has not been deprived from Nigerians just in the last six years. It has been there like that. Nigerians have always struggled. It, it has always been a struggle. It has always been a difficult terrain. 
it's not been easy. You know, I I I I was um I, I was sent to India some years ago for the mm. course. And you know, as much as I see poverty in Nigeria, the one I saw in India, I I I'm I'm trying to I'm fighting my thought process not to remember some of the sites of poverty that I saw in India. And this is not me trying to make any comparison with India. It is me saying that, yes, you need government support. Yes, you need support from one person or the other. I'm sitting down here. I'm not going to tell you that I've not gotten support from some angels that God has made in human forms that have come to this earth, that have helped me and my family to succeed or to get this far. I keep telling somebody, I said, today you can ask me for 1,000 error. I will give it to you. I won't feel it. But there were times that Somebody gave me 100 Naira. And in real sense of it, that 100 Naira saved my life. Mm. So people must understand the scenarios. People must understand the challenges. People must understand that there is poverty everywhere. People must understand that different governments and, it's, and, and their different um, positive sides and negative sides. And that the reason why Africa is where it is it's not just because Africans are not good to themselves. It is also because some powers that be across the world are collectively working towards the improvisement of Africa. But Africans are failing to see beyond what is, like, what is in front of them to say, at what point must we unite to fight the real enemy and remember and recognize that we are not our own enemy. Mm -hmm. That was why when we talked about Niger and the rest of the people that are coming to the country, I tried to defend them by saying they are looking for greener pastures. Because by the time my plane takes off from Abuja and I look down, I do not see any borderline between Kazina, Sokoto, Kan uh, Jigawa, and Niger Republic. It's the same people. Yes. But so powers that be decided to create a demarcation and call this their own space so that they can continue ripping the people. That's what I said yesterday um, during uh, our program. Someone was commenting about Chinese people if we should allow China, Chinese people to live in Nigeria. So for me, I believe that why should we restrict foreigners from living in our land? I'm here in Canada. Am I a Canadian? No. I'm not a Canadian. Why should you say we should not allow China? You know, these days people are going crazy about Chinese people uh, living in Africa. It depends on the country, okay? Like what we said earlier, that a computer system whereby everybody in the country should be recorded. Should be recorded. Anybody, anybody can live in your country. Exactly. You, just need, you just need proper documentation. Exactly. If you are so scared that if the Chinese come, that they will start uh, owning the country and then put it in, in into into the law that no no foreigner can ever run, rule your country it's, it's simple it's because of the law why because why do you country. why do you think countries like canada are great do you think it's because of canadians no it is because they have agreed to allow people from all over the world come into canada to help grow it thank you why do you think why do you think some of the greatest cities in the world are like london dubai and and new york it is because they've allowed people to come in Yes. For those people that come in would have to live under certain rules and regulations. Thank you. That's what I said yesterday. That uh, Chinese people, we should not restrict them. They have their own experiences that they can use. We can even tap from their experience. We can tap from their experience if they come to Nigeria and stay in Nigeria. Chinese people, they are not just, they are, they are very, some of them are very educated. Some of them are very professional. You understand? They have a lot of resources that we can tap from. The problem we are having in Africa is that the continent, some countries in the continent are not implementing um, laws that regulate foreigners. Even themselves, like in Nigeria, our laws are not effective. Okay, if we have the computer system, for instance, like Canada, if you come to Canada now, they must record you. There's no way you can enter Canada illegally. Your movements, where you are staying, your address, your phone number will be recorded. But in Nigeria, it's not like that. It's easy for people to come and uh, find a loophole in the system, okay? And even abuse the system because we don't have effective laws that will regulate these people in the country. 
Chinese people are not bad at all. If we allow them to stay in our country, we will gain so much from them, from their experience. But according to what is going on in Africa, they are complaining because it's a trending news among Africans right now about Chinese people. That the Chinese people, uh, they are forming a kind of neo-colonial ideology in Africa. They are taking over Africa. They forgot that without the Africans themselves, Chinese people cannot just walk into any country and implement a mining site without the support of Africans themselves. I did a show based on this. How can that happen? You know what happened in Ghana? I'm repeating it again. Uh, Chinese people, they, they established a mining site in one forest, a Prama forest in Ghana. And they said this forest was under the watch of a forestry commission. The forest, the forestry commission has an office very close to the mining sites of these Chinese people. Mining site is not a small, it's, it's not a kind of a, a small site that somebody cannot see. Very big, and um, if you see big land, they occupy a very big space inside the forest. Could you believe when the police finally um, detected this site, the forestry commission says that they were not aware of the site inside the forest. So they gave you this forest to monitor all the activities going on in the forest. And somebody uh, established a mining site inside the forest for almost one year. Now you are telling the government that you were not aware of the mining site. Really? Even though the mining site was very bold and obvious inside the forest. Which means these people might have bribed them, give them small money, not too much money. Maybe they just give them a couple of few dollars. They will allow them to establish a mining site inside the forest. And today, tomorrow, we'll start blaming Chinese people. Never blame Africans. Blame the laws in Africa. Blame the African leaders for not implementing laws, effective laws to regulate foreigners in the country. Africans themselves are the ones involved in this business without them inviting Chinese to the country, it can never happen in this world. There's one other case in uh, Uganda, Ahmed. Honestly, I've never seen anything like that before in my life. Could you believe that uh, the government of uh, Uganda ordered the arrest of some Chinese investors for illegal mining in the country? You know what happened? During the arrest, one of the ministers in the country uh, was in the site during the arrest. The Chinese investors, they start fighting a minister. They start fighting a, a Uganda minister. If you see the way they rough handle the minister, I've never seen anything like that before. Can you try that in the West? Can you fight a minister in the West? No, because the law will, will even give you the permission to do that. You understand? It's because of this. Who knows what happened? Maybe they, they might have collected money from the Chinese people to establish the many sites in, in the country because otherwise nobody, no Chinese person is bold enough to come to Africa and just establish a many site in a forest, government land or someone's land. It can never happen. Look, Nekpe, look, I, me, I've told you, mm. we have our own problems. So. Okay. I'm seeing some comments from some of your people and, mm. and, and you know, as usual, Nigerians will always look for who to blame. Someone said, the reason why we're in this mess is because a few elites in Abuja are busy there, uh, you know, stealing our collect common wealth. Look, those few elites that you're talking about in Abuja, mm. I'll give you an example with one of them. He was a governor. Let's just assume that we mistakenly voted him as a governor because when we voted him, he started stealing money, started stealing money, started stealing money, started stealing money. He got into office, did eight years. After he did eight years, he now told the people that he wants to go for Senate. The people that said he was stealing money mm -hmm. still came and voted him to get into the Senate. Uh, he got into the Senate. Mm -hmm. He did four years. He did another four years. Mm -hmm. The people are still saying yeah, a few elites are in Abuja. Do you know that even if you push for a, co for, for, for a case and say we have a senator in our community that is a thief. And so we have pushed through INEC for a recall. All of you that have been saying you do not like this senator, can we come together and go and vote on this day so that we can vote this amount of people to say 
we want to recall this senator and put a new one. People will not go out to vote. We are a true reflection of our system. It is us. We chose this upon ourselves. Honestly. Until until we take a break and understand that we are the ones that have allowed these things happen to us. We are not going to go anywhere. Exactly. Exactly. Who say we do not have laws in Nigeria, Mr. Oso Godwin? We have laws in Nigeria. We yeah. have laws in Nigeria. Yeah, but when you, they are not what? The, the law. There are laws in Nigeria. Every yes. Uh, uh, every laws we every law we have here in the West. The same thing we have in Nigeria. The problem is the is, is the question is whether or not the laws are effective in the country. Let me give you an example of how we are a true reflection of our people. There is a, there is a young man who used to, to do car wash business. As he was working as a car wash, um, a, a car wash uh, man. And then all of a sudden, people stopped seeing him. They did not see him again. Five months later, they started seeing him on TV with gold, with diamond, with private jets, with a big office, with some nice cars. And then police now said, ah, ah, what is the source of your wealth? We would have to investigate you. And then Nigerians came out, investigate what? You didn't investigate him when he was poor. Now that he's rich, you want to investigate him. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of people have we become? Uh. What kind of people have we become? Do you know that? Do you know that a politician would steal and he knows that he would get, even if he doesn't pay them, they will go out and protest that they should not try him in court. Do you know that some of those judges get threats, threats, yeah. messages mm. from people just because they are benefiting from a certain senator and you tell me that there are no laws in Nigeria? There are laws in Nigeria. There are but laws. The, but the same Nigerian people are the ones that will ensure that those laws do not work. Well, yeah. I was a lawyer. Honestly, I'm into the legal profession to make money for myself. But if I see a case that goes against my morals, I will not take it. No, I will not. These people don't. People don't mind. They don't care. No, honestly, I, I mean, I think you have to explain to this person. He said, uh, "Let's stop deceiving ourselves." what type of law we have we have the laws we have laws in nigeria the question is whether or not the laws are effective that is what you should be saying not that we don't have laws i mean please take it from there take it away. i'm not taking anything i don't have any time for those kind of questions if you have something that's important <laughs> i can respond to <laughs> okay with not too much in this session about okay Saturdays, let's see this one let's read this This, Mr. Uh, Uwa Osakwe says, um, uh, most Southerners have little or no knowledge about our brothers and sisters in the North. Too much misconception and misinformation. Exactly. Yes, people, some people think the problem is the North. Some people say, and most people in the North think the problem is the South. Yes. You know, we, we have been so blinded by some people that are stealing away from us. Yes. And you see, this is exactly how the colonialists prepared our mindsets even before they left. And we, a new generation is coming on board and we are refusing to see beyond our noses. I we are still agreeing to those stupid uh, stupid myths that, oh, if you go to the North, right. they are living large, they are living big. Come and see poverty. No, Come and see people suffering. No, they are not people saying that. They are not saying that in the North, uh, people are living large. They said in the North, uh, there is poverty. I know that. But um, a few years ago, I interviewed one of my brother he lives uh when he was young he, he was raised in the north he was raised in the north the father was working in the north he said when he visited benin the first time eh, he was pissed off with the way people were living the corruption lack of respect and everything but some of us we are naive about what is going on in the in the north and people are propagating fake news too much on social media these days it, it is it is the see that is why i say that's why i say look for example you are an educated man. You are a grown man. You are in your 40s or your 50s. You have children. Mm. Any moment from now, you are going to leave this world. And then you see a message that is inspired by hate yeah. and most, most likely a yeah. lie. And then you take your hand 
and then you share that message. And then when somebody tells you, oh, this message is not true, say, oh, eh, me too, that's why I receive them now. Uh -huh. Can you imagine forgetting that some of those things that you are pushing out can actually incite a war that will consume you too? What is our problem? I keep complaining about fake news. Uh, and Nigerians in diaspora, sometimes they are acting on impulse in terms of uh, sharing fake news. Unfortunately, unfortunately. They are acting on impulse. Anytime someone someone does generate any fake news, they will all take the news seriously, even though it's a fake news. One day somebody woke me up in the morning with one fake news that Buhari, President Buhari just got married. I woke up in the morning, the first message that came to my WhatsApp was that, uh, oh, watch this video, President Muhammad Buhari just got married to a new wife. When I look at it, I said, how can, how can you live it in diaspora and believe this type of foolish message? Yeah? So that's so, sometimes- So what? So what if he marries a new wife? Uh, Is that even our concern? Is that our concern? Is that something that should be a priority? Really? It's unfortunate. Somebody said nothing is working in Nigeria. Okay. Well, it's okay. We, we, we have heard you. Thank you for your viewpoint. But nothing is working. Nothing is working. Well, Nipe, Nipe, Nipe. <laughs> since we started this interview, right? Okay. I'm, I'm on NEPA. Since we started this interview, NEPA has been working. Since we started this interview, it's been almost an hour and a half. Mm -hmm. I'm, I don't want to say anything before that time, but from the time we started, there's been electricity. From this morning till now, there's been electricity. I haven't changed for any reason power source. I, I can show you the window. If nothing was working, you are supposed to see pirates or terrorists going around with guns, killing people. But everywhere is quiet. Uh, but not that Nigeria is perfect. Not that Nigeria is... is Nowhere perfect. is perfect. Yeah. The number of people that die from gun crimes in the United States is more than that that have died from Boko Haram. Yes. That is our problem. That is so true. That is so true, honestly. Crime rating in the US is very, very high. Very high. So what, since I was born there, is this word I have been hearing. Nigeria will get better. I want to know when and how. <laughs> I like this comment. <laughs> well, I will tell him to go and ask his Baba Lao. As I think this question applies to every Nigerian. Do, do not ask me. Do not ask me this question. You have to ask answer it yourself. <laughs> Let him ask his Baba Lao. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see another one. Who else Akwe is saying that we should fight for a united Africa? Let's expel our let's eliminate our borders and stand as one, bro. That is the answer to the problem. But even in Nigeria, we cannot eliminate the difference between Hausa, Ibo, and Yoruba. So, you can, this is just to let you know that we're on a long thing, we're not ready. We're, we're not, not ready because the only reason why some people do not like Buhari is not whether he's dishing out good governance, it's because he's a Hausa man. The only reason why some people do not like Jonathan is not whether he is doing well or not doing well, it is simply because. He is not a house man. And that is what is going to happen if we produce a Yoruba president tomorrow or another, even if we produce an Edo president, people will complain. Besides, yeah. even if we produce an Edo president today, if he comes out and say, I want to contest from, for president in Edo state, where is he from? Benin. The Isha man will say he's not going to support him. The yeah. Aotima will reject him. Yeah. This is our problem. Exactly. You said it. This oh. is the problem. That is our problem. That's our problem. They will not forget that this, this is our real problem and start looking for who to point fingers at. We yeah. have our own problems. Yeah. Even within even within states, even yes. within states in Nigeria, we see how I'm, I, I am telling you, eh? I am telling you. If for example, now Buhari will say, I want to pick a minister in Edo states, uh, and then he sends a message to Edo and say, Give me a list of one person to give make a minister. He will wait for that list for one year, no list will come. They will keep fighting themselves as to who right. to pick among themselves. Exactly. This is the problem. At those stage right now, just because we are we we have different tribal groups in at those states, we still have that problem. Okay, we have problem of tribalism. Uh, this one is not a Bini person. The other one is not uh, Asian. The other one is not Afema. We have that problem in at those states. Let alone Nigeria as a whole. And if we say Africa as a whole. 
forget it. That will never happen. Never ever. It will uh, never happen. If we cannot unite in within only one state, how can we unite the whole Africa? That is the thing. Uh, well, it's been nice talking to you, Nekwe. I really, uh, as, as always, I enjoy talking with you and Thank your fans. And, and, and I'm hoping that Nigeria gets better. And I've come to the realization that for it to work, uh, it has to start with our individual mindsets and belief system. Um, I still tell you success is a state of mind. It is what you feel, it's what you believe that can help you to be motivated to succeed. But if you're already hands up, even be before the whistle is blown, yeah, forget it. You can't do anything when the match starts. For me, restructuring Nigeria, um, and for me, the way I will evaluate Nigeria and how we can restructure Nigeria, I will say from the family. From the family, we should learn how to raise our children in a corrupt, free environment. From the family to the school system, like what you just said earlier, that uh, students in the school, they were practicing corruption in elections in school. So from the family to the school system, so that we raise, if you want uh, a honest president in your country, you have to raise your children to be honest so that they will become the president and be a honest president as well. So we don't normally talk about the family, how we raise our children, how children learn uh, corruption in the school system. So, but we want a messiah to come around our country, of which we are not we are not raising messiah in the country. So we have to learn how to raise our children in a corrupt-free environment in the school system. We make sure we minimize corruption in the school system, so that the children, any child that went to school and uh, practice corruption, or the professor in Nigeria, professors want you to pay money in order for them to give you good grade. Uh, professors want some some girls to sleep with them in order. So, what do you expect of those students? If, for instance, uh, they become ministers in the country, they will also practice corruption. So that is the thing. We have to make sure we minimize corruption in our various homes, the school system, so that we will be expecting a messiah to run our country. That is my own insight about Nigeria and the corruption that we are always complaining about. Otherwise, we are not moving forward at all. If we said the youth are coming to come and rescue Nigeria, I don't believe that. As far as the youth they were raised in Nigeria, given what happened in this past election, and for me, I'm still saying it, that I don't think the youth will rescue Nigeria. The only person that will rescue Nigeria, it can be a old person, it can be a youth, anybody can rescue Nigeria, but saying that only the youth um, will rescue Nigeria, that is, for me, I don't believe that. On a, on, a, on a closing note, I, I would like you people in the diaspora and the media mm. to, to be careful when we speak about our electoral process to mm. be corrupt. I just explained to you all the levels of people that work with INEC. They are mostly ad hoc staff. They are people from the streets. Mm. They are coppers. They are lecturers, university dons mm. that are asked to conduct these elections mm. and, submit, and submit the results to INEC. INEC said its entire staff strength is about 7,000 people. 7,000 people cannot conduct that election. This is just a clear indication that it is the same Nigerians that decide the outcome of their elections. In other words, if we continue saying that our election was rigged, was rigged, was rigged, and we do not have any proof whatsoever to present, then we are doing ourselves a huge disjustice. On that note, I want to thank you for this opportunity, like always, and I and I pray that we all have the better Nigeria that we're all seeking for, at least in our lifetime. I mean, thank you so much, and uh, I so much appreciate you uh, honoring our request for these interviews. And moreover, I would like to commend your work. You are very honest, and uh, I'm always proud of you having you as a Nigerian youth candidate at that time. I was very impressed. And I will also thank your mom for raising you to be a great uh, citizen of Nigeria. God bless you, mom. <laughs> okay, then, thank you. Bye.